When I think of Philippine cinema, there are two particular movies that come to mind. There's of course Henry Luna, which dramatically depicts our transition from Spanish to American rule and the beginning of the Philippine-American War. And then Goyo, its underrated sequel that continues the story beautifully, highlighting a key moment in the war, the Battle of Tirad Pass. Both of these films recreated Old Manila like never before and were the first films that made me feel truly immersed in our history. Today on The Individual Collective, we have the brain behind these two masterpieces and the co-founder of TBA Studios. Because there's nothing like a collective experience. Mm -hmm. You watch it, you're making love. Yeah. You watch it alone, you're masturbating. Yeah. On, you know, Mr. Ed Racha, hope you enjoyed the show. Mr. Ed Racha, thank I, you so much for being here. Bob, Joey, glad to be here. Cheers. It is Cheers. truly an honor. You are a legend in the Philippine film scene, in my opinion. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I just came into it late as a producer. I just want to say that you have utilized your unique combo of your love for Philippine history, filmmaking, storytelling, music, to create value for the millions that have seen your work. And again, it's an honor to be sitting across someone who's played such a huge role in changing Philippine cinema. And, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Because <laughs> you actually are very good at taking people back in time. Yeah. So I want to start off the show with taking you back in time okay. a little. So I'm going to show you this picture. And I just want you to take me back to this time. And for the audience who doesn't see it, this is basically... Oh God, that was the fire and rain days. <laughs> this, is, oh, this is the fire and rain days. Yeah, that's with all my friends, uh, Santi, you know, your Tito Santi. Yeah. yeah. Audio listeners, it basically looks like the Bee Gees came to Manila and stayed. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like? Because you were in college during martial law, right? Or yeah, I was, um, I was here, but I, I was in college. I graduated in 73. Mm -hmm. Spent one year in San Francisco. Then I came back. Mm -hmm. And what was it like during that time? Because it was your party time. It was your young days. You had well, we had parties. We just didn't go home if it was past midnight. You know, we just keep it up. You yeah, know? yeah. To some people, that that's what it sounds like. It's like okay, there was that one curfew, and every now and then they bring out you know their force. But let me tell you a funny story about a friend of mine. Yeah. I had a curfew pass. I did because of the shipping business. We had to go ships. Every, you know. But he had one too, in the same company as me. And then, so he went to a party with his wife, and he had it already. If we come, if we first to come home, she put a pillow and he put blankets in the trunk. <laughs> yeah. And so he partied. Then, uh, two o'clock or something, he went home, put his wife in the trunk, went home, went up, started taking a shower, and the guard woke up. Hey, there's somebody knocking in the trunk. <laughs> he forgot his wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like the. Perfect care package for <laughs> yeah, the yeah. curfew, you know, just the pillow and no, the blanket. Yeah, it, was, it was actually quite orderly. I mean, I guess any rumblings would not be felt. We just went to work. We did what we had to do and that's it. You know, lived with it and uh, when you come into a situation, you learn to adopt. Mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit before this recording that 10 years after martial law was stopped or after the People Powers Revolution. Yeah, 1996. Nine, yeah, 1986. Um, 10 years after that, 1996, that's the moment that sparked you to write Henry yeah. Luna. Why is that? Because um, all the idealism that came with the people power revolution, the poor were still poor. Drugs were beginning to just get all over the place. Mm. Well, there was always drugs, okay? Yeah. But not like that. Rampant. Rampant. And I was disappointed that uh, the way things were going and... Uh, the outline of Henry Luna, because I said, how can I show what's wrong with this unless I show us in the past? Mm -hmm. We had the Spanish locked into Intermuros. Mm -hmm. We could have gone in and, and they would have surrendered to us. So then if the Americans came, they would have to talk to us. Mm -hmm. No, we, we somehow we didn't have that thing. Luna wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. We never had that moment. Yeah, we had another uh, opportunity when the, the Americans were first starting to come. Mm -hmm. To fight right then and there. Yeah. And that way, it, it would have uh, looked to Congress in the United States as, no, let's not go there, man. <laughs> <laughs> they hit us first, you know? You know like, when yeah. the guy came up and said, uh, who was it, President McKinley? Uh, mm -hmm. Last night I spoke to God, <laughs> and he enlightened me and told me that the Philippines needs our, needs our help. We have to Christianize them, civilize them. In order to civilize them, we have to educate them. Mm -hmm. And in order to educate, we have to Christianize them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you look at some of the, there, there's some ads back then with that president that you talked yeah. about with so, yeah. selling soap, saying like, we have to alleviate like the white man's burden and like. Yeah, yeah, little brown brothers take care of them, you know. Yeah. So I said, okay, are we still little brown brothers? Mm. I wrote Luna. <laughs> wow. And we'll, we'll get to Luna. We'll get back to Luna in a second. Um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about your acting career. So you were in the first movie you did, and this is translated to English, but it was called This Is How We Were Before, How Are You Doing Now? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually that movie, you know, was set in the time when the Spaniards were still here and yeah. like the, the American takeover as well. So Yeah, I, pray, I played a horny priest. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Yeah. <laughs> It's also directly related in a way to Apocalypse Now. Ah, okay. Eddie was relieved of uh, Apocalypse Now to do his dream project, which was this. Wow. And um, Fred Roos, I think you've heard of him, right? He's the, Who's that? He's one of the producers of Apocalypse. Oh, okay. Godfather 2. And, he and Godfather 2, wow. He, he, he discovered so many people. Wow. Meryl Streep, Al Pacino. I mean. Shit. And he's historic. If you look him up right now, you'll see what he told Eddie Romero, who was trying to cast the thing of a Spanish friar. Goes, he goes, hey, call Eddie Rocha. <laughs> and then, so <laughs> Eddie Romero called me. So I was cast, I, I was recommended by one of the top casting agents in the world. I mean, wow. Him. And how, how old were you? So I was 25. Wow. They, they wanted me to look older. They, I didn't like the makeup they gave me, but. What I did, I gained 20 pounds. Oh, wow. That must have been fun. I gained it. You, know, <laughs> and, uh, you, see, you, you look at me at 20 pounds on that thing. I'm so much thinner than I am now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and I never, when Eddie Romero auditioned me, mm. hi, uh, you speak Spanish, you go fluently. You speak Tagalog. Very bad, badly. Mm. I said, I just came back from the U.S., you know. And he goes, good. <laughs> um, you can really speak Spanish? I go, talk to me in Spanish. So I did. He goes, okay, you, you're it. I go, don't you want me to read? No, no, no. You're the one. You're, you're it. Wow. That's fast, huh? And that's where I met Peque Gallaga, who was, mm. uh, he and Lida Lim were the production designers. Mm. The ones responsible for Aura Plata Mata. Yeah, yeah. Well, Lida and, and Peke did the excellent production design, which was really the birth of proper. I mean, of oh, there was always production design, but not to that level of details. So mm. It was wonderful. You know, and, uh, Eddie's oh, what a what a great guy. And just to sort of backtrack a little bit, what got you into filmmaking? Was it that moment, or no, was it? No, since I was a kid, I was I would love movies since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I would make Super 8 films, and, you know, I was 12, 13, you know, all the way to 17. Yeah. And then before I, I even, uh, before I even did kind of talk to me on, I directed a half an hour uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. I went to Cuyon, the leper colony. Okay. Okay. And uh, for, I mean, it was like to help the lepers. Mm. And... Uh, from what I remember, it brought in $50 million of wow for them. I didn't charge my, for my work. Oh. But it, I mean, it was a 22-minute documentary, 23 minutes. That's amazing. And when I was uh, uh, shown in Spain, I was surprised I got a big standing ovation. Wow. That must have yeah. been awesome. It was, hard, it was also hard to shoot because it was, you know, it was, uh, I couldn't even have sound there. So we had to just do all narration later on. But. Uh, we had good shots, mm -hmm. breaking shots. And this was uh, back in the 70s? or 75. 75. So this is like before the acting gig. Yeah, so yeah. I, I directed that and produced it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, from then, I but I would also do theater. I kept, My debut was in the CCP, mm. uh, in an operetta, uh, Merry Widow. Mm -hmm. But with a great director, Tony Mabesa, you know, I mean, he's a legend. Well, having that theater background is key, I think. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah. It would makes a lot of great yeah. actors, you know? Yeah. So what is your uh, favorite step in the movie-making process? Thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. you know, Letting it marinate. Yeah, yeah, you start developing. Once you have a script, 
then you do the pre-prod and you could and all of a sudden the minute you start rolling it's work hard work ah uh, that's when the real work the, begins you know uh, there was a movie by Pier Paolo Pasolini called the Cameron where he frames the stories of Boccaccio playing a, a artist supposed to do a fresco mm. in a chapel when he finishes it by the end of the movie he goes back and forth into him after every story he sits down he's looking at his work he goes it was better when i thought about it <laughs> <laughs> damn that, that that's so true Something though like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the starting the new idea and like sort of like st- developing the story and like coming up with the characters yeah. and like thinking like how, how does this story, how, how can we drive the story forward? Like that, that's the exciting part. That's the exhilarating part. Once you have that. And to me, I, I don't want to work without a blueprint. Mm-hmm. I don't want to produce anything because the blueprint for the film is the script. Yeah. So once we're satisfied with that, the work really begins. And how do you get that? Like at what point do you say, okay, this script is good enough. That's, Hit the record button. First you start, no, you start by casting, okay? And then you do readings. And when you see the readings, you see if it works or not. So that's the time you mm. you can play, mm. okay, and rehearsals. And then when that's done, you do the final thing that go. Then you're planning the... And casting is like super casting, yeah. important. Well, casting is like first we get friends to read it, you know, mm. to get the idea. Because a script's not meant to be read. It's meant to be seen. Yeah. Be Visualized also, yeah. yeah. And it's a great process. I mean, but the process, me as a creative person, is once uh, uh, once it's shot, another fun part is editing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing I love. Yeah, it's like putting all that the process. pieces together. It's yeah, like a puzzle, yeah, puzzle in a way. Exactly. I was gonna say jigsaw puzzle. I love jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. And that's where I, you know, I, I, when I'm doing jigsaw puzzles, I'm not really thinking about the puzzle. I'm, just, I'm somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. I'm planning maybe a story or a lot of stories came to me. I obsessively watch films, you know. Yeah, and just I like watch, nonstop. And I always finish a film. I mm. never walk out. Mm-hmm. I give the filmmaker the due respect to complete it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just saw something that I was very impressed with. It's a movie called Pig. Pig. It's by a first-time filmmaker, and it's with Nicolas Cage. Oh, wow. Okay. And I don't know how to describe it. It was that unique. One of the best films I've saw this year. Wow. And one of the best performers, uh, performances. Was it the performance from the pig or from the... <laughs> no, Nicolas Cage. From Nicolas Cage. Okay. <laughs> well, he is a phenomenal... He's a legend. He's a legend. Well, and- he was here when we did Apocalypse. Oh, yeah? Little Nicky Coppola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but, but he wasn't in the movie, right? No, he was helping out there. Oh, uh, he was helping out? So, like... Yeah, he's a Coppola. You know that, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, he, he was heavily involved with that. Yeah, no, he's... I, I never really met him, but I would just see him, you know. But. Were you in the set of, he- no, of never, Apocalypse no, Not? No, no, We were just helping in whichever way we could. Yeah, yeah. Just the soundtrack we of that. We with, you know, with Coppola and that other stuff. And he rented my father-in-law's house. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we, you know. So, yeah, you bumped into him for sure. Oh, yeah. But. Yeah. So, you actually really love bringing people into these worlds, as I mentioned before. What is it about, what, what is it for you personally? Like, why do you love bringing these worlds back into existence? Because how can we understand ourselves today if we don't understand our yesterdays? Mm-hmm. If we don't understand our yesterdays, we can't understand our todays. How will we understand our tomorrows? Mm-hmm. That's how simple it is. How many times have you thought of your childhood? What made you who you are today? Mm-hmm. Joey. It's all these collective experiences. Right. Yeah. And you, when you think back, don't tell me you don't, because you do. That's human nature. Mm-hmm. Back, you know what? Or you see something, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, this is how I felt. What, why did I change? Why? It's almost a, an inner monologue about who am I? Mm-hmm. And trying to express that, trying to figure that out. And yeah. also. And what more a country? Yeah. Where relating it to. It, yeah. Where is our conscience? National conscience. Where is our, where, uh, where is our uh, identity? Mm-hmm. Well, that's been one of the main themes of your work, the finding out what is that Filipino identity, right? And that, that struggle in a way of trying to figure out what the Filipino you know identity where that is. Part of me was in Ganito, Adi Romero's Ganito Camino, Pano Kayo Neyo. Mm. That's the way we were. What are we today? So, okay. based on that, did we really change? 
Mm, not really. Are we <laughs> under, you know, a colonial power? Are we still, are we independent, really? Mm. It puts a lot of questions before you that you have to answer. And, and for the future of our country, first of all, we can't stand alone because the geopolitics right now, we have to play patty cake with a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> but we have to have our own identity and our own set of goals. And honestly, when Henry Luna came out, that was like one of the few times I really felt the Philippines united because everyone was talking about it. Yes. All my friends, all the, my history teacher, he just showed it one day in class and it blew my mind. And, but everybody was so proud of it. And you could tell that, you know, it was one for the books. Yeah. People, a lot of people registered to vote. So a lot of the, a lot of the tricycle drivers, uh, well, okay. I'm driving, having a cigarette in my car. Mm. Window down, and we stop in the traffic. There's a fishball vendor with the taxi drivers, mm. jeepney drivers, and taking their break and lunch. And you know, and they were talking about Luna. Wow, shit! Cross, I mean, it's crossing over in all levels. Yeah. They said, "How the hell did they see it?" Mm. That's a good question. No, it was pirated. They were buying pirated DVDs for twenty five pesos. A lot of people are mad at that. But I said, how can you deprive them from watching a movie? And that's that's true. But that's something to give them a pass. Mm -hmm. Make a deal with the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. the Let them come in. They should have a maybe specialty to watch a movie. That's how you can. But mm -hmm. you can't get mad at them for, for using pirated films. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree it's with that. It's the way the country is. Yeah. They're making the use out of what the situation is. Yeah. So some entrepreneur will come and get it. And they suffer. It costs them maybe two or three pesos copies stuff for 25. They're the ones I want to kick, but I can blame the people who buy it. Yeah. I'm driving. I see a bus driver in the middle of Luna's run with a pirated copy of Luna. <laughs> but they were watching it. Yeah, yeah. And and I said, okay, I can die now. I mean, I've if I don't do anything else after this, I'm good. I've done my part for my country. Bravo. That's Fucking beautiful. And then Gerald, the very talented Gerald Carroll, had a vision of a trilogy. Goya was the second one. If Luna was fire, because I wrote and I was angry, Goya was a meditation on our ills and using a lot of the words of Mabini. Mm, yeah. The character of Mabini is fantastic and, as well. And, um, and then now with all this stuff that happened here, I don't know when... Guess one will be made, but I hope one day. But right now it's all in the air because of the Yeah, the turmoil yeah. happening right now. And we'll we'll get to that in a second. But since you were talking, I, you were mentioning a little bit about how you would do things. You know, how, how would you change uh, Philippine cinema in a way? So my question is, if you were running the show here, if you were running the show of Philippine cinema, what would be some changes that you would do to further this trend of us being globally recognized? Well, put it this way, we were globally recognized in the 30s. Yeah, the, 40s. the golden era, yeah. Okay. The second golden age happened with Ganito and, and Lino Broca breaking into the international market. Yeah, and That, of course, is the beginning of something great, but also something terrible because they cho choose only to pick films that show the Philippines in a part in a in a you know poverty porn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are the 70s <laughs> and, like and bomba it's, era. It's as, if, it's as if no, no. Poverty Pornography. I mean, it's like uh, poverty pornography. Okay, yeah, it, it's yeah. Like they're they like the, you know Europeans. Oh, we should count our blessings. Look at those poor people. Mm, yeah. So they really portrayed us in but a bad the light. It's not there. Yeah. Or, you know, it was like going back to the neo-realistic films of Italian cinema. Uh, you know, after the war, uh, but it hasn't progressed. Our, our the image of film hasn't progressed from there because. Great director, Brillante Mendoza, deals, still deals with the same subject. What where, are where, where other subjects? That, mm. So what would be... I would first have a film commission and have the governor, the, the government, uh, come in and support our filmmakers, send them to the best technical schools in the world. Mm. And then when they come, come back, support their films market their films. If we ever get, um, you know, because we were, we were given the chance to have our films represented at the Oscars. Okay? Uh -huh. But you send it there, okay, it's, this is our Philippine entry, but it never makes it because there's no PR. No one there. Yeah, it's just there. It sits and nothing happens. But I would support that. 
get our image. Look what Korea did. Yeah. There, that's the example. 14 billion US dollars a year for their movie industry. Yeah, right. And But the thing is, like, I, I brought this up in a previous ep- episode with the mural artist. The creative class in the Philippines isn't monitored. Yeah. Meaning, like in, in Korea, they know 14 point whatever billion dollars a year, they will earn that. Yeah. And they can yeah. improve on that. There's a metric to sort yeah, of track. Sure. But here, we have no idea. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's sad because we have the talent. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Look at Marvel. Marvel has the best animators. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. A lot of Filipinos are there. Yeah. Know? But all our time's going out instead of... Yeah, they're, all, they're all leaving. Uh, I'm saying if the government would back, back this industry... Mm. There would be incentive to stay, yeah. They No, and, and it would be thriving. It would be... You know, it would be popping, yeah. And like, you know, I used to distribute films back in the 70s. Right now, look at this. I brought in films like Murder, the original Murder on the Orient Express. I brought wow. Apocalypse Now. Wow. Uh, Death Wish. Mm. And, okay, we would time our movies when no local. If a local film would open, we'd wait a week before putting ours in. Yeah. We would quake when a local film would open. That's how strong our industry was in the 70s. Wow. They were like, we don't want to have our show up when the local films are out. And now... Local filmmakers are trembling every time a Marvel uh, film comes in. <laughs> yeah. We have lost our identity as Filipino audience. Yeah. Well, I think that one thing that Henry Luna proved, though, was that there still is a palette there. You know, that there's this misconception, and I think it leads to the content creation, too. Sure. That That, you know, we have to dumb down our movies. We have to, you know. Oh. But it's not true. That You guys prove that. that yeah. you, like, Henry Luna... Sure. Like, from like you said, from every single class, yeah, it connect, it resonated yeah. with yeah. them. And precisely, I wanted to give honor to every Filipino by not scrimping on quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And you took your time. That's what I loved about it too. Is that usually a lot of films today are you know made in like ten days, two weeks, yeah, you know? sixty days. Yeah. See, so like just to. Prolong that and extend it and yeah, really yeah, yeah. take your time with it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, that, that's the way to do it, in my opinion. Like, I don't know and why well, there's so much rush. You know, it, it's the money. It's really the money. Oh, yeah, that's true. It's the budget. You know, if a movie costs you uh, 10 million pesos, you've got to grow theatrically 30 million to break even. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, people try to bring it down, but <laughs> Filipino, I always say this is DBA's model. The Filipino deserves the best film we can ever. Mm-hmm. That's how we honor our countrymen. And if a lot of other businesses thought that way, I think we'd have a very a stronger economy, a stronger country. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly because, you know, like you said, there's a lot of budget constraints and with budget constraints leads to, you know, constraining if the, if the, the quality. But could help, you see, the filmmaker yeah. by giving a grant. It would definitely... Sure, sure. We need a strong film commission. So... Now let's transition a little bit. Before Henry Luna, I just want to talk about your writing process. Um, what is your process, particularly for screenplay writing? Well, it depends. Like with Luna, I just did the, that, the assassination scene first. Ah, oh, you started with the end. Yeah, with yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That's the money shot. That's what's going to be talked about. That's mm. what's get the emotions up. How do I build up to that? Yeah. So then after I researched that, I started going back. Mm. So if I had more money, I wanted to have some scenes in Europe. Mm-hmm. Well, we did have the dream scene. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where he is in uh, Paris a, yeah, a little bit. But that was that was all in the studio. It was obviously, a studio shot because it was like a dream, a memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Done one take. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Wow, that's well, amazing. Shoot just that one scene. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a uh, yeah, definitely difficult to shoot uh, Henry Luna because. Harold is, um, is a master director. He's wonderful. And there were so many changes, right? Because you had Henry Luna for how long? How long did you have that screenplay in the bank? 1997, first version. Wow. And the, the year you were born, you said? Yeah, the year I was born. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so walk me through that. How, how, how long was it in production? Like from the time you wrote in 97 to the time it actually well, we, we was started, released? We started shooting in 2013. Uh, 14, mm. 2014. Yeah. Um, so from 97 to 2014, when yeah. did when did the uh, Gerald Tarot? 17, 18 years. Oh, that was, um, 
I think he came in 2012. Okay. Yeah, because so Gerald is actually the director and co co writer of uh, Henry Luna, and he had the idea of you know what there should be a story about Henry Luna, and found out that you know what somebody already wrote a script. That's right, and right? he found it because he won a prize at the FTCP. Mm-hmm. He came to talk to me. I said, "Okay, first before we go any further, give me give me your give me your reels." Mm-hmm. And I binge watch all his films. I said, "This guy knows what he's doing. He can make one million looks like look like ten millions. Wow. With a good budget, this kid will go play. I mean, he'll, he'll be great. Mm-hmm. Proven correct. So he, what was that process like to co-write it with him? No. We had the script. Yeah. He came back mm-hmm. and actually reinserted a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Yeah. He added stuff that I was forced to remove from. And he passed it by me and I said, oh, fine, I'm, I'm going to go. No problem. I mean, we never even sat there. We just discussed it. That's yeah. It. Wow. Because I knew how we... Yeah, so you knew already, boom. Because no, and if he put something I don't like, I can always, I have that thing to stop it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So far, he put back things I forgot I had originally put in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's he great. Added more, he had an extra battle, he added more stuff. It made it more relevant to, to the use of it, which is who I was targeting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seemed like such a great collaboration. And no, what was it like to see him working on the set? Like, What's his directing style? Is it like a Scorsese where he like allows the actors to improvise a lot or do you have to really sort of hit those notes in the script? No, he, um, you know, he's very simple. He goes simplify or amplify it to the actor. Like amplify your performance or simplify it, bring it down a bit. He always prefers people to come out bigger so he can, it's easier to bring down. Mm. But we have readings and he picks Actors he trusts. Okay, so you have a, he had a great uh, AD, mm-hmm. and Gerald would just sit there and he would just look at everything through the monitor and see the movie in his head already. Because mm. he edits his own film. He does a scoring too, right? He does like, a scoring too. So you know, there's a rhythm in his head already because he, he never he never majored in the film; he majored the music. Mm. So there's a rhythm through that whole movie. Wow, so it's like. He says he looks at the script and dissects it like a like a symphony. You know? Yeah, well, that's probably why you guys collaborated so well because you also have a, a musical background, right? <laughs> no, I like music. I love music. My father loved music. Um, I grew up with a lot of music around the house. Mm-hmm. But the way that music plays a role in movies is so. Important. important, like, and I, I love like the ending scene of Goyo when the yeah. ladies just walking yeah, away, yeah, and you have that yeah. scoring in the background. Like yeah. that was yeah. so such a great way to end it. Yeah, yeah, but yet it wasn't as well received as Luna mm-hmm. because I, it, it, although it's a very important film, mm-hmm. and in some ways maybe even better, uh, more constructed. Yeah, and it's a lot more grand in a way. Yeah. yeah. But somehow um, people watch it and still watch it, okay? Mm. It's important. But somehow it didn't grow as much. Mm. It didn't grow as much. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, you know, it's just that. No, and, and well, people expected to see Goyo riding down the hill. The yeah, they, yeah, they expect him to be Henry or Luna, but they're totally two different people. No, like, it's funny with Luna, everyone's, uh, one reviewer said, this is ridiculous. It took so many people to kill him. I go, well, it was underplayed. Mm, but that's not true. No, it was underplayed in the film. Oh, it was underplayed in the film. The last scene of yeah. Henry Luna? Yeah. He was able to walk out of the convento. What? One arm dangling and one arm holding his gut. Holy shit. And they finished shit. him off in the plaza in front. If we showed Whoa. that, it would have been unbearable. Yeah. You, yeah, you definitely pushed the limit though. But Tra- uh, He chose to, Gerald chose to tone it down a bit. Okay. And stylize a little bit. And you know those inside details because like your grandparents actually knew the Luna brothers, right? Like yeah, sure, did sure. they did they like give you any inside scoop or well, did I never you- met my grandpa? My father said that his father his father told him the biggest tragedy in the war was the assassination of Luna. Well that brings me to like I was planning to save this for later, but I want to ask it right now. But sure. what if Henry Luna doesn't die? What does history? What does the history of the Philippines look like? Well, I can't really say because speculatively. Yeah. Well, I would like to say, what if Aguinaldo listened to Luna from the very beginning? Mm. You have to and hit and hit the Americans first. Yeah, because if you look at Congress was split in half. Yeah. 
So how do you convince them to go, oh, we can take them over in three weeks, it's ours. Mm -hmm. So Battle of Manila Bay, see, we're in, we have, Spanish surrendered to us. We can take over. Congress didn't like the idea. So Luna started being a thorn in their side from the beginning. The minute their ship lands, the troops are shot, killed. They would say, hey, look. look. Imagine the Treaty of Paris, there was no one from our side. There was no representative, yeah. That was, that was brought up in the film too, like he was like, is, is anyone in? Yeah. Is anyone re representing us? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, it's just, you know, it's hard to really like speculate like what America would happen. I always wanted to have, at one point, and it became the imperial, it, the mind became, okay, world, not world dominance, like, let's have some, look at, you're, all the powers in Europe have a foothold in Asia. We don't. Mm -hmm. It's about time we do. What can we do to get it? Uh, yeah. Who's the weakest power there? Spain. Let's start the Cuban. Yeah, they went to Cuba first, right? And then they went to the Philippines after. That was it. That, to me, that was a goal. Mm. First, to control the government in Cuba. Mm. Secondly, to colonize the Philippines. We're the only colony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at one point you in... You understand the times. It was just the tenure of the times. Yeah, the... They had this idea too back then, especially when World War II happened, right? When they bombed us. Yeah. In in FDR's speech, in, when he says, you know, on this day is a very sad day. Of day and day of infamy. Yeah. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Like, and they bombed Manila too. And then he crossed that out because it would sort of represent that they're one of us, you know, but, you know, they, we, they still came, MacArthur came a couple of years back, you know, I shall return. Uh, they still helped us out, but they had that separation where they were, we were theirs, but. No, he was more interested in Europe. Oh, uh, yeah. Japan was the excuse to go to war. The minute they declared war on Japan, Hitler declared war on America, and they were able now to go. Mm. But we were the. We were the colony. I mean, not the colony, the Commonwealth. Commonwealth, yeah. Okay. They left us, they left us last. Wow. If it weren't for the guerrillas, which is what Color of Fire is all about. Yeah. And that's what Henry Luna was suggesting to Aguinaldo, yeah. right? Yeah, to do the guerrilla warfare. warfare. Yeah. And that's what they ended up doing in Goyo. But too late. Too late. They spent five months partying <laughs> while the Americans were amassing the troops in Manila. So America didn't have anything to do with the provinces first. Shit. They were amassing the troops in Manila, and what were they doing? Partying. Wow. That song in Goya, if you look carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, especially in the first part, like, Goya's very, like, in his eyes are really to the women, you know? Yeah, He's women like, and his image. And yeah. He was a narcissist. Yeah. And, and I wanted to show, yeah, so we had Luna's cap. Now it was Aguinaldo's cap. Mm. Well, you know, it's. There's no villains. It's just everyone had their agenda. Everyone had their beliefs. Uh, we are made of uh, frail and flawed human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that showed. And, and in Goyo, what made him a hero is when he said, this is what I have to do. That's mm -hmm. when he grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he was in the Tirad Pass. Able, had he had been able to repel the Americans, what he could have become mm -hmm. at such a young age. Yeah, and they call him the Eagle. You know, yeah, like he, yeah. he he did like such wonders at such a young age, um, and he had very high hopes. And yeah. he did do like you know he did do a lot, but he just seemed overwhelmed. Like his hands were shaking. Yeah, yeah, you know, he had, he had P PTSD. Ah, he was having PTSD. Yeah, yeah. Shot in the head. Probably had that scene there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, the it's hard to hard to run an army when you have. Freaking yeah, PTSD, yeah. you know, like. So we had that. We had Luna in mind. And Gerald said, "Let's do a trilogy." Then he had in mind doing this meditation on ourselves and on a flawed hero, which is uh, Goyo, mm -hmm. hero nonetheless. Mm -hmm. The third one was going to be about Kesson, which would go into two different timelines, a little more of a political tongue in cheek, a, a satire, pretty much, because the true animal, political animal, was Kesson. He was brilliant at that. Mm. Brilliant. Well, I, I was reading up about Kazan actually, and what interested me was I thought that Kazan City happened after he was president. No, 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 no. Wild. Wild. Like he was like, I want a city named after me. Can, can you speak to that? Like a little bit like- I just, don't know I, if he did. I mean, 
they recommended, of course, he said, of course, yes. You know, but yeah, yeah. But um what he did with the Jewish refugees was yeah. a beautiful, beautiful act. Mm -hmm. Can you can you expound on that just for well, people who don't know? It although our movie on Luna doesn't uh, on Kesson doesn't touch of that, but there's Kesson's game. Yeah, I, I, I've heard about that. And yeah, it's, uh, it's worth watching about just because of that. Although, it may not be entirely you know accurate, but still the feeling of the times were there. Mm -hmm. uh, Kesson wanted to bring them in, and the Americans were blocking him. Mm. He wanted to bring in more refugees, mm. and the Americans wouldn't allow him. They said no, only so much. Why is that? Uh, that they had their reasons because Washington refused them. Mm. I mean, in the United States. Wow. And that said, see, Hitler said the world doesn't want them, so I guess I got to do what I have to do. Wow. He sent them on a cruise, on a ship, port to port. Would you take the refugees? No one did. They wow. called that the Voyage of the Damned. That's another movie people should watch. Heartbreaking. Yeah. That's crazy. And. Just going back to like what you were saying of, you know, how you portray these characters. And I'm really excited to see uh, how you portray Kazan. But you really don't try to make anybody a hero or no. the villain. No. You're really no. trying to just like portray see, this is a human their, spirit. And, and, like, and like even Paterno and all those people are saying, but we don't, we can't beat them. Mm. And Luther's bad. Yeah, but we could have. Tried. Yeah. This, but, you know, still... Now you want to compromise, you fall right into their hands. So each one had their reasons, you know. It's going to destroy business. It's going to, we don't have enough bullets. We have, we don't have oh, they're destroying our crops. Let's stop the war. Let's come to an agreement, you know. Yeah. Look what's happening in Ukraine now. Mm -hmm. Same thing, in a way. In a way. What to do? Yeah, it's like very tense. Because right now we're at the state where it could just escalate to, you know, places that we haven't seen before. And, you know, when the Americans came, they did a lot of great things here. I mean, mm -hmm. There's no doubt. Education, education and uh, all that. Know, yeah, I mean, can't deny that. But there was that bloody war <laughs> that people forget. <laughs> and also, it was almost, uh, look at carefully, borderline genocide. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. That's why Robert Stone, uh, a little pitch we said him was one line. Before Vietnam, there was the Philippines. Wow. <laughs> yeah, except they won. They kind of won the Philippines in that sense, just because they had to sure. buy it for 20 million pesos <laughs> yeah. and, and save the Spain, $20 the Spaniard, dollars. 20, sorry, $20 million. million dollars. Days, yeah. yeah. And save the Spaniards their shame from losing yeah. against the Filipinos. Uh, the Philippines could have. Yeah, we were right there. Been, we were right there. And then the Americans would have been forced to come in and talk to us. Yeah. They would have had no reason to come. But even the public didn't want America oh, to really come over. Congress was split, split in half. Yeah, yeah. Had we become a thorn to their sides from the very beginning, Congress would have said, no, let them go. Just help them out. Just yeah. Out. So I wanted to ask also uh, your friend, Fernando Ortigas, who helped fund oh. the movie. <laughs> Biggest angel in Philippine cinema, in my opinion. Oh, wow. Nice. No, he's an angel because he... he, he Trust, trust the directors, trust the writers. Yeah, it seems that way too. Like, never told him, don't do this. Don't mm. do no. Well, he said, he had a funny quote that I liked. Um, you can't stop building a house. Like once it, once you start, once you start yeah. building it, you can't just stop. And yeah. you know, Ortigas is in the construction. Yeah, yeah. So I, I love that analogy. But my question is, was there ever a time when you felt like the house was on fire? <laughs> During Luna, no. We were going, awesome but I predicted that, you know, they had young indie filmmakers and they were doing, we can do it in these days. And I did my homework before, mm. even when I worked for a Corman film before, mm. I saw how things work. I said, you know, they're saying they could do this for since 30 something. No, it won't happen. I told Nando, they're giving you this. Prepare for much more. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you want to go where Gerald's going, which I agree with too, but. Open your eyes. So, I mean, this is what it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. So, when we, and in spite of that, we still went over mm -hmm. uh, because of weather. I mean, and uh, they underestimated the magnitude of that, you know. And uh, Nando said, <coughs> we can't stop. Let's finish it. Mm -hmm. Let's go. It was full. Full commitment. force, yeah. yeah. 
Well, that's good. Like he's one of the people that why the film even was possible, you know. So like big credits to him. No, and really. He without him, you wouldn't have heard of me. You wouldn't have heard of, of Charles' big masterpiece. Yeah, masterpieces. Pieces. Masterpiece. Yeah. Even his small film Bliss to me is a it's a horrifying masterpiece mm-hmm. if you watch it. So talking to people like him, like as a producer. How do you pitch, you know, movie ideas to potential investors? Creatively. With pegs, mm. photographs. Mm-hmm. If you want to know what cinematic style is going to look like, what the look is going to be, okay, watch this movie. That's the look. So mm. a clip of that, put it there. Mm-hmm. Soundtrack. Something like this, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So just getting the whole sort of feel for the movie, getting right, right them to feel the, it. With The Color of Fire, which is about the Battle of Manila. Um, that can be done alone here. It's too big. Mm. Unless the government takes it. Supports it, yeah. Yeah. You need uh, a foreign uh, yeah, support for that. For support of that, yeah. Mm. It's a very big movie because you have to, well, you have to destroy Manila. <laughs> yeah. Percent of it, at least. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of that now is also like, you know, CGI. CGI exactly. But that's still very expensive, right? Like you had like sixty, fifty animators for sure. Hanna Luna, Luna, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, and for Goya, and for Goya, yeah, Goya even more. Like Goya had all these like, super Goya, fast the scenes. We had a backlog. We built the whole town. Yeah, just like the and old we days. It to represent another, we just turned it around to represent another town. Ah, wow. So, the yeah. closest thing to Hollywood that was ever done here was Koyo. Mm. Yeah, the old Hollywood too. But it shows that we can do it. Yeah. It shows it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. With the right support. Yeah. We were also the first uh, production to insure our film. Mm-hmm. Against typhoons, against fire. Against, think of it. Wow. Could have set us back. And we were able to claim some. So was it harder to film Goyo or easier having to do having done Henry oh, Luna before? Goyo was harder. Oh yeah, harder. Yeah. So much harder. The Tirad Pass was that real? No. Okay. We uh, Gerald went there. Yeah, yeah. So it was just impossible to track our equipment up there. Yeah. So we they found a mountain, Mount Balatas, mm. not far from here, but still the track. It took um, maybe an hour and a half to get there. 45 minutes to climb the mountain and by foot about 20 minutes to get on the set. Oh my Carry gosh. Them. Holy shit. Yeah. So, I mean, there is CGI, but there's a lot of like physical and, you know, real shots for sure, you know. And, and the beauty of it, when Goyo is just looking at that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, like at that moment before we were shot, he was just looking at all this, this beautiful country. Mm hmm. And he was sniped just about, he was about to get on his horse and he was sniped. Yeah, yeah. A few seconds after. Yeah, that was uh, very shocking. Like, I was watching it a couple of days ago and I, I, I forgot. <laughs> I honestly forgot, yeah, like, how yeah. shocking it was. Yeah. But And a lot of people complained that he wasn't uh, running, running, uh, riding down the hill charging the Americans. That never happened. The Americans invented that. Mm. So they would look like bullies in the world arena. Mm. He was a valiant warrior. Because if he wasn't a valiant warrior, why'd you kill him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. He was sniped in a way. They, they shot him as he was charging. But he was shot in the back. Mm. Yeah. Well, that relates to a question, actually, that I wanted to ask you about. Because, again, you, you really bring these. You're really into period pieces. And you do a fantastic job of bringing it to life. But how do you balance playing around with what to put in the books and like creative freedom and like what to play around with. Well, you know, of course we were not there. Yeah. So the dialogue is pretty much. In the- yeah. All the dialogue. Yeah. You know, but the whole thing like with Luna was biologically, that was the whole thing about it. Mm-hmm. That was the whole message of yeah. And the burning of the flag signified that we are the we burn our own flag every time we accept a bribe mm-hmm. or pay a bribe. Mm-hmm. Every time we turn our back to people to to what, what needs to be done in the country for our own 
for our own benefit, like uh, you know, uh, making other people suffer so you'll make money. Mm-hmm. You earn a flag. Yeah, that symbolism there again about that Filipino identity and how we haven't found it yet. <laughs> that it's. Uh, I also wanted to ask you, how would you describe? your own filmmaking style. Because what I love about some of your movies is the combination of these dark, real, gory events. But at the same time, you have these comedic moments too. Yeah, that's Gerald. A lot of, well, there was a lot of comedy in some of the, in the cabinet scenes. But yeah. Gerald added that thing of the, it's like Mada, you know, <laughs> other things, you know. Uh, the style is, it, life is a balance. There's always sometimes in the darkest time, you laugh. Mm. And there's an absurdity to life that I always bring out. Watch our other films. I mean, go to our YouTube channel, uh, TBA Studios, and mm. like and subscribe. A lot of our films are there. There's a little gem there called um, uh, Patintero. Mm. It's about a Filipino game. It's a kid's film, but it also goes to what happened to that? Mm. Why are we keeping the kids behind Gadgets. Yeah. And why aren't they playing and Then anymore? we have one about, um, you know, a documentary about the, the, over, uh, the, the overseas workers in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Uh, Birdshot's another good movie. We yeah, Birdshot. The old director then. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, Woman of the Weeping River. No professional actors in it at all, and yet they won awards. Wow. Have you watched it? No. Watch The Women of the Weeping River. It's a masterpiece by Sharon Dayok. Yeah. There are a lot of these like gems that I think the public just doesn't know about. And that, that goes in to like Europe, the marketing. In Europe. Wow. That, in France, yeah. Like, what do you think that we should do in terms of like the marketing of the movies here? Just like these local the movies. The government has got to be involved. Mm. Any film that's looked upon, you know. Um, that's the only way, really. Unless, I mean, you guys did it independently, but you guys yeah. had... You know, it was gut wrenching. Enough, we didn't have all the funds to do it justice. Yeah, yeah, but the fact that you guys did it independently—that just shows a lot of balls. Nando, yeah, Nando's got the bigger, biggest. Balls. <laughs> I was quaking for it. Oh yeah. Well, going forward, actually, looking to this new project that you have, is there anything else that you can sort the of? The project we're doing now is called Grace, and it's um, a very. A new, it's uh, it's the first genre of piece, but I, I don't know even where it falls yet. It's it's about the murder of a, of a college student. Okay. A girl who name is Grace. And she's an artist. She creates. Mm. And it, it's a little more than just a murder. If you when you see the movie, you'll see there's a lot more to it than that. Mm. And I co-wrote that script. Okay. Nice. It's brutal. It's mm. gonna be very brutal. And how about um, for the the Kazon movie? That is on the back burner. We don't know where we're going right now with that. Mm. It, it's we have to look at if will people go back to the theaters or did they get used to staying home and watching streamed or yeah, that, pirated versions? You know. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? On the whole streaming versus theaters experience? What's right? we have during the pandemic? But a lot of films that had terrific potential, I think, lost it because of no theatrical. Yeah, because you do miss that. I mean, if you're watching it on this 15 inch, look at look at America laptop. I mean, I went there last Christmas. And mm. I went to the theater for the first time in two years. Oh, how? Which movie was it? Uh, we saw West Side Story and Spider Man. Okay, West Side Story was empty. Good for us. Spider Man was full. Yeah. Okay. But before, like, if you'd have 30 films released, you only had maybe six, seven, eight. And uh, now slowly picking up, but we'll see where it goes also. Because look at that. I mean, like, they're streaming. Uh, simultaneous streaming and release. Disney. Disney. Yeah, they can do both. You know, but I still think they should They should let the theaters have it first, in my opinion. Mm. For at least a couple of weeks and then... No, uh, as long as it's going strong, keep it there. Ah, uh, okay. So then... Yeah, so can I shoot like a DVD? You're already telling people, hey, you don't have to go now. You can watch it for, okay, especially US, okay? You want to watch Spider uh, Wonder Woman, okay, let's say? Mm. Um, $30 to watch it. 
if they you go to the cinema, you pay for your whole family about fifteen dollars each. Yeah. Plus. Plus popcorn and sex. It's very it. expensive there. Yeah. yeah. So people say, oh, just watch at home. You have big screens now, great sound systems. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You can, have, you can have surround sound at home, you know, I mean, so. And we've set it up for the past two years. We've set up our home theaters in a way because yeah. we've been living at home for yeah. two years. So with the pandemic, people resorted to that. Now, will, they, will it go back to normal? We don't know. It's, it's a wait and see attitude. Yeah. But still, I hope, because there's nothing like a collective experience. Mm -hmm. You watch it, you're making love. Yeah. You watch it alone, you're masturbating. Yeah. Come on, you know, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what it feels like. That's exactly what it you feels know, like. <laughs> ooh, yeah, ooh, ooh, I'm enjoying this. But where's the, you know, when you see the theater, oh, react or, yeah. you know. Like, imagine Luna had it not gone to the theaters and the collective spirit with people rising up at the end mm. and clapping. Yeah, you need that. That's what films are all about. That's, yeah. From the moment when someone figured something out, the caveman went to the walls and used whatever colors they could with whatever twigs or leaves to show the thrill of the hunt. We were born to story, to tell stories. Yeah. And we're born to tell it to a collective audience. Mm. It wasn't meant to just be told to yourself. Yeah, it's meant to, those stories are meant to be shared. The oral tradition of storytelling was always told around a group. Mm. Well, you know, we have our own little cinema. If you want to watch it, watch it there. It's one of the best projections in town. All right, where is that? In uh, Nona, Cinema 76. Okay. Yeah. Sitting benches. You know, it's a very, you feel like a home. God, I, I hope they fill up again, all theaters. Yeah, it's really been sad to see like the theater life go away but as a filmmaker i am in total support of theatrical screenings it is a full experience you know otherwise yeah. you know and, and to watch it with strangers that's what i love you know uh, like yeah it's something you, you get on the same wavelength you know what that is yeah if only the country could get on the same wavelength <laughs> yeah we could become great and for a moment we were in the same wavelength when well twice when you release henry luna and, and goya oh, in my yeah. opinion i just hope that Film of this caliber will make it to Cannes and not the poverty porn films. Yeah. They're very good. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to complain about the filmmakers there, but hey, there's more to, to the Philippines than that. Yeah, and you want to show all sides to it. And I, I, I honestly love like the way that you guys really bring back the historical worlds because we weren't there. Like We, we read about it in the history books, but sometimes even no. the history books don't tell us the, the full story. You know, they're, they're just rattling off facts rather than feelings. And that's what we did. I mean, we did other films too, even rom rom-coms we did, but yeah, we have our twists. It's yeah. a TBA stamp on it. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, well, I don't know. I want to say preferred, but do you have more fun with the period pieces or like the rom-coms? No, and uh, no I, I, I have fun making films. Any yeah, film. any any genre. So are there any, any genres that you're looking to explore moving forward? This one, this is action and uh, suspense and, but again, there's always more to it than that. Mm. The pandemic, if you watch uh, Dito Doon, um, creatively, I mean, how do you do a movie about the pandemic where people don't meet each other? Well, watch it and you see how we handle that. Mm. But also the tragedy lies, and it's very subversively political too, if you look at it. Mm. Well, that seems to be like a sort of TBA stamp in a way. <laughs> yeah, and I hope Grace will do the same thing. So when was TBA founded and how did well, that sort of come about? I had, you know, um, Nando Ortigas always had to call films. I had one, Butchie Boy films. And Gerald had his metric films. But when we did Luna, we set up one with Gerald as a stockholder too, called Articulo Uno. Articulo Uno, so yeah. To call Butchie Boy, Articulo Uno. We branded it in 1960, uh, 2016, I think, or 2017. We branded mm. it as TBA. Ah, okay. So it's really the partner of Articulo Uno in a way. Well, no, like uh, the... Articulo Uno is just, it's to call Bucci Boy and Gerald. Combined, yeah. But it's all the other films are to call Bucci Boy, but mm. still under the TBA banner. Okay, right. So they're still involved in that. You know. Miguel actually interned there in uh, TBA. I did. I did. Oh, yeah. When was that? For Goyo, I, was, I, I came on the marketing. 
Okay, great, great. Yeah, that's why you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so many people were there, right? It was crazy. Yeah. yeah. It was crazy. So what, what is your thoughts on, you know, you've seen a lot of the youth uh, and the talent of the youth nowadays. Uh, what are your thoughts on the future of the film industry here? With the talent we have, okay, it can go. To great. I mean, if the government backs them up. Mm -hmm. If the government is behind the film industry, we can, we can penetrate them. Mm. World class. Ed, this was certainly one for the books. Uh, thank you so much for your time and, of course, your valuable insights into the industry and, of, of course, the craft of filmmaking. And again, we're all very excited to see the next movies that TBA comes out with. And thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Oops, let's go here. It's easier. <laughs> Eddie Rush, everybody.